Lowell Gentry, who after 32 years of service retired from the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences at the University of Illinois. Um, that was back in 2022. Um, and he is now contracted by the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association. Although he does continue to be involved in several NREC funded studies, he has passed the torch to Dr. Yu. Lowell is a native of Illinois. He was raised on a farm in Ogle County. His interests are in the areas of soil fertility and plant nutrition, and his research focuses on management strategies that reduce tile nutrient losses. It's all yours, Lowell. Thank you. Happy to be here today. I'm older now. I need to wear glasses to see what I'm doing. So uh, I'm going to be talking about our uh, replicated tile drainage study in Douglas County, Illinois. And uh, you've heard some of this before, but this is uh, an overall summary of phase one. Uh, and we have a publication um, that I will point to and, and talk about some of that data. Now we had 36 monitored tile laterals on this farm. And uh, that's a look at the farm there, as far as the monitoring stations. And uh, I've heard my old mentor, uh, Dr. Fred Belo, speak many times about what it takes to get high yields. And so uh, I'm not sure if I stole this from you, Fred, but I, I'll say I borrowed the idea that uh, tile drainage is a prerequisite for high crop yields. Tiling often pays for itself uh, in higher yields. And so uh, how does it do that? Uh, it allows for timely field work, which often translates into earlier planting dates, which is also very helpful for yield potential. Uh, and uh, clearly it reduces the impact of ponding, helps with soil aeration, and also soil temperature. Here's a uh, topographic map of Illinois. And uh, so I was just going to point out some moraines. Uh, the terminal moraine, uh, the last glaciation. We're actually sitting on a moraine right here uh, at the I Hotel. Um, and, uh, and this entire area from the terminal moraine all the way back to Lake Michigan is, is all going to be tile drained, uh, probably pattern tile drained eventually. Um, there are two mountainous regions of Illinois that were not glaciated in the northwest corner and, and down south. Uh, but uh, let's say the upper two-thirds of the state was uh, flattened and scoured by glaciers, and that is poorly drained prairie soil that benefits from tile drainage. Uh, there's an old tiler, uh, old trencher there, and uh, our, our new uh, machinery that can quickly insert tiles into the ground. Uh, a little history lesson here, there is a father of American tile drainage. His name is Johnny Johnston. He's a Scotchman. His grandfather once said, verily the earth needs draining. Johnston said uh, to area farmers, tiles will pay for themselves in just one or two years. Apparently he was a very good salesman because uh, in just a matter of years, um, there were uh, 10 tile drain factories um, that were in his area after he showed how effective tile drainage was on his land during his lifetime. Now this is just to show you what the central area, uh, central Illinois area looks like where we uh, have our replicated tile drainage study. This is after a two inch rain in April and I'm just going to go through some pictures to show you what it looks like around here when we get two inches of rain. And we have channelized ditches that, well, in this part of the air, uh, earth, it's, it's lacustrine. It's the bottom of an old glacial lake bed. So uh, they probably weren't even hardly uh, ephemeral streams. We just came through with a dredge in the 1880s and dredge streams, and then we tiled to that. But they were random tiles. Now we're pattern draining the entire fields. And you can see why. And now we're getting into, uh, getting closer and closer to our fields. But even if it's not holding a big pond, you can see the soil is saturated. If there was a well out there with a pressure transducer, the groundwater would be sitting right there at the surface. Now we're getting into our tile drainage study. You can see a few of the monitoring stations. And you can see some ponds uh, that actually 
affect some of our tile drainage. And actually, we've done a study. I'll touch on this since I'm following Dr. Marganot talking about phosphorus. Uh, we already published a paper on phosphorus coming out of the tiles, and all of these low spots end up as uh, uh, de depositional areas. And so they're very high in, in P. So variable rate P application would be very useful in this area. Stay away from low areas. They have enough P, often because the crop gets drowned out, and so there's no removal. Now here's uh, one of our plots that's in cereal rye. You can see how large our plots are. These are 2,000 foot long laterals. It's really been an impressive site. Um, I, I want to thank uh, the Dick Searles family for allowing us to uh, work on their land all these years. But uh, you can see that uh, that cereal rye would be happy if it was uh, not staying in a pond. And, uh, and I put this up here just to say end of pipe treatments at this time, they're all flooded or they're having a massive bypass flow. They're, they are not working when it's uh, this wet. But the cover crop already has done its good work. It's got that nitrogen in the crop and it's hanging on to it. And so, uh, whereas uh, end of pipe techniques are gonna disappoint in a wet year. I, I'll just give you f my philosophy on that. I, I think it makes more sense to try and hold the nitrogen in the field in the first place, to try and use it for the next year, so catch it in a cover crop, to hold it, keep it out of the tile, instead of letting it come out the tile and then send it back to the atmosphere only to have to start the Haber-Bosch process all over. So I think strategically it makes more sense to address this problem in the field. Now I show this picture here. Uh, that now you can see that the cereal rye is brown. Well, that's because we had terminated it. Well, we got another two inch rain a month later. So th from that standpoint, this is a bit of a challenging site, but this is the, the reality of it. Uh, the ditch fills up and, and the tiles stop flowing for a while, and so we have to wait for the ditch to clear and then the tiles to run. So here's what the tiles look like on that farm. Now, this farm, as you can see, needs tile, and it was one of the first to be pattern drained that we know of. Uh, and in fact, I, I met the tiling contractor. He's still going after all these years. Uh, he said he started putting the tile in in 1979, and every time the farmer had a little extra money through the 80s, uh, they kept putting tiles in, and they were done with it by 1990. So those tiles have been in there a long time. And so we chose 36 of them, um, and uh, we blocked such that we would have 18 that were gonna be in corn and then 18 in soy, and then the corn soy switches back and forth in a corn soybean rotation. So there's 18 tiles um, in one field and 18 in another. This is what our monitoring stations look like. We have an agri-drain structure that has a V-notched weir plate in it and a pressure transducer to get the height of the water over the V-notched weir. We relate that to flow. Uh, we water sampler for um, uh, our ability here to take nutrient analyses of uh, nitrate, ammonium, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, we send all those samples back to our lab, and Corey Mitchell does all the analysis. Thank you very much, Corey. And uh, <clears throat> this study was essentially trying to spoon feed the crop, synchronize fertilizer application with plant N requirements. So we were looking at split N application. The hypothesis was that if we could more carefully spoon feed the crop, we might improve crop yield and we could reduce tile nitrate loss. Also built into the study is the timing of N application. We have a cover crop treatment and we do have one reduced rate treatment just to make sure that we weren't over fertilizing because we would expect the reduced rate treatment to hurt yields. And, and in fact, it did. Um, we had six treatments, three replicates. That's the 18 tiles. Both phases of the corn and soybean rotation. That's what's really unique about this study is that we have both corn and soybean plots out there at the same time, simultaneously getting the same weather, sitting in the same soil type. And they're large plots. Uh, they're 100 feet apart is the tiles. So essentially, the plot is a 50 foot on either side of that main tile. Our end treatments, uh, we, we go with a, a full rate 
which is 180 pounds of N per acre. That's the MRTN rate for corn after soybean in central Illinois. We use anhydrous ammonia with an inhibitor in the fall uh, against a three-way split where we're putting half the N on in the fall, 25% uh, at planting, a two by two side dress, and 25% as UAN, uh, a side dress. A full rate in the spring, no inhibitor. Uh, then a reduced rate, a 75% rate in the spring, again anhydrous, no inhibitor. And then another split, where we put 50% of the N on in the spring as anhydrous, and then the other 50% as UAN side dressed. And then that same treatment with a cover crop. And we were trying oat and radish, something that winter killed ahead of corn, um, and then cereal rye after corn ahead of soybean. Now I'll just tell you right now, we didn't have any luck with the oat and radish. And uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, we were working with a farmer the first couple of years, and, and the, uh, the soybean were drill planted, so they're in seven and a half inch rows, and we, we came in, airily seeded the oat and radish, and, and uh, it essentially just got smothered by the, the uh, leaf drop of the soybean. Uh, that was the first year, and then the second year it was just too dry. If you, get, if you broadcast a cover crop and, and you just get a little bit of moisture, the radical comes out and then it gets dry and dies, and then that's what happened to us in year two. Uh, year three, we decided, well, we'll avoid that. We'll just wait till after the uh, uh, soybean is harvested and we'll come in and drill. Oh, it was very effective. It was just too late to get enough biomass to matter. So we actually failed three times in a row with oat and radish. And then we decided, well, let's go with something that overwinters. And we tried annual ryegrass. And uh, we, had a, we had a polar vortex in 2019, and it killed all of it. I think we were sort of fortunate because then it turned out that my experiment was nothing more than cereal rye ahead of soybean every other year. Here's what uh, the six treatments, we then did a randomized complete block design. So the six treatments are, are randomized in that arrangement there. Let's just go right to the corn yield. And uh, you can see that uh, based on those letters that are above the bars, uh, there's only one B, and that is the 75% rate. So uh, that cost us about 8% yield. And, uh, but none of the splits, or the, neither of the two splits, significantly increased yields over their full rate, single, or their single rate treatment. Um, and uh, fall in is, is right up there as well with the rest. And so... Uh, yeah, 208 is the best yield we got. This is an average over four years. So maybe that's that the three-way three split helped a little, but uh, that wouldn't be cost-effective, that small increase. So looking at the soybean, uh, we wouldn't expect any uh, difference in yield there. I don't know why the three-way split somehow was the highest. I think that's uh, just coincidence. But uh, we do grow a good cover crop in front of soybean, and that did not help or hinder the crop yield. <clears throat> now here is uh, the first two years of data. We actually started in 2014, but 2015 turned out to be a setup year in a way because uh, we weren't able to put fall in on that first year and we didn't have cover crops. So really it was a period where we looked at the baseline differences between the tiles and they were really quite good. We were, we were very pleased that uh, there was that much uniformity across the 36 tiles as far as nitrate loss. So 2016 then being our first year with fall in and uh, our first year with cereal rye. And there's the fall in effect, the black and the red dots. Black is the full rate, red was the 50% rate with the two other splits that follow the next season. But uh, clearly there's more loss with fall in and then there's the cover crop effect. In fact, we had our whole story after year one. We could have dropped the mic then, but uh, we, we continued on for three more years and, and, uh, and it, it essentially reinforced that first year's data. This is what the cover crop looked like that first year that uh, you saw the tile nitrate go down. Um, we had a little more than a ton per acre of above ground biomass, had 26 pounds of nitrogen in it, had a fairly wide seed-end ratio, this idea of immobilization versus mineralization, 
That would be an immobilizing potential. Uh, that's what the concern is in front of corn. That's why we went with the overwintering grass in front of soybean. Now here's all of the tile nitrate data. And you can see that the black and the red dots are the highest during the corn phase. They also stay higher most of the soybean years as well. But clearly fall N is leakier than spring N. But let me point out 2018. 2018 was a very cold winter. So the, uh, the good thing about that is, is like it, it, it lowered all boats. So tile nitrate was less for all plots, um, especially the fall end plots compared to the other years. Uh, that was not a good year for cover crop growth. But I can say, uh, well, don't fret if your cover crop didn't grow in a cold winter. You didn't need it as much anyway because you had less loss. So <clears throat> this is a cumulative tile load graph where uh, anytime the, the line is flat or, or horizontal, there was no tile flow then. So all these little ripples that increase, those are individual tile flow events. And since that first year separated all the treatments, the separation just got a little wider by the end of the fourth year. And as uh, we would have expected from year one, the, uh, the fall end treatments lost the most. Um, and then the 50-50 split with the cereal rye every other year um, lost the least. But it's, it's interesting to point out that the 75% rate, that reduced rate treatment, lost just as much nitrate to the tile as did the 50-50 uh, split with the full rate. So that says something about the split rate working. But it's, it's interesting that uh, we, lost our, we lost yield, but we didn't significantly lower tile nitrate. And it's because we lose nitrate after soybean as well. So that sort of masks the effect of the efficiency during the corn phase. So <clears throat> looking at, this is a five-year average. We actually had a, an extra year of, uh, of this treatment in phase one. Um, and uh, so I added that because 2019 was such a bad year for fall end. And, and let me recount that. You, you guys probably remember anyone that was trying to plant in the spring of 2019, that was very difficult. So that's really the culmination of a late planting date and then uh, two really large events um, in June and July. So, and the plants were really small, they just hadn't taken up much nitrogen, and so there was a lot of nitrate that was vulnerable to leaching. And, uh, and But 2020, we were right back down. But I like showing this graph to make that point that the 50% in the fall, with 25 at planting and 25% side dress, falls intermediate to the 100% in the fall versus 100% in the spring. So when we do the statistics, load's a little noisy. And so uh, we're not able to get significant differences but the trend is always such that when we do split the N application, tile nitrate is lower than the full uh, rate, a single rate. This is the paper that uh, we just had come out. Um, I don't have a slide that shows uh, how appreciative I am to all these authors, but hey, I made you an author. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but John Green, um, He's not here, but he does all of our sampling. He, he did 95% of it. I, I covered a few times. But, uh, and then Corey Mitchell, I mentioned, he's our lab supervisor. Luis Anduno, Andino was our grad student. Um, just to follow up on what Andrew uh, said uh, about legacy P, in, in uh, Luis's study, we found two tiles that always carried more dissolved reactive phosphorus than all the other ones. And, Lo and behold, there was an old farmstead that was torn down in the 40s. And right where the barns are, uh, are our two tiles. And so we are getting legacy pea from manure 80 years later, still coming out those tiles. So legacy pea is clearly a difficult problem to solve. Uh, and then uh, Dan Schaefer, who's here in the audience. We couldn't do this study without Dan. He was 
tremendously helpful and, and instrumental in getting it done. And Emerson Nafziger uh, helped me with some of my writing and uh, helped with the paper. And, and also Emerson and, and a lot of us were sitting around the table thinking of these treatments in 2014. Uh, Bob Haft was there, Emerson Nafziger, uh, Dan Schaefer, I think Shalimar was there, uh, some other industry folks, and we picked those treatments based on, uh, on that conversation that day. So here's, here's one of the most important tables in that paper. Uh, it's showing the loads of the tile in a, in a year. So this is a four-year mean of, of, the, uh, of the tile loads. Now, loads are noisier, and it's harder to get statistical differences between loads. But I put them up there to put it in context. Uh, fall end lost more than 30 pounds per acre during the corn phase and another 17 during the soybean phase where uh, we could get uh, tile nitrate loss down to less than 10 pounds per acre when we had cereal rye ahead of soybean. So that's quite, uh, that was quite a good drop in uh, tile nitrate. Um, we, uh, we had quite a range, really. Um, but you can see that the splits aren't lowering the tile nitrate or the flow-weighted mean um, very much, uh, just maybe 10% or less. So it, it helps. It's always in the right direction. But uh, it's not going to get us as far as we need to be when we think about our 2035 goal. So in some conclusions here, splitting the fertilizer end application did not significantly increase corn yields. I have no problem saying that statistically. It did not increase corn yields. However, you know, it, it, we didn't significantly lower tile nitrate either. But the trend was always there. It's, it was always in the right direction. So it's clear that splitting helps. Um, we weren't able to, to get significant differences with, with just three reps. So uh, tile nitrate loss was clearly greater with fall and applied than spring applied. In fact, uh, fall and lost 12 pounds per acre more than spring applied. So 100% in the fall versus 100% in the spring, that was 12 pounds per acre more. Now that's only 7% of the fertilizer, 12 divided by 180. So it's not very much fertilizer. So that's why it probably didn't affect yield. These rich soils mineralize enough N to make up for that loss. But that 12 pounds per acre, that's 38% of the tile nitrogen load. So that's the rub. It's not a big loss agri agronomically, and it didn't cost the farmer anything in yield, but there it is, almost 40% of the tile load. So it's, it's, I cannot say it's more efficient than spring N. I would say it's not. So spring, apply, spring application of only 75% of the recommended fertilizer end rate decreased corn yields by 8%, but did not reduce tile nitrate. A couple more conclusions. Cereal rye ahead of soybean every other year in a corn-soybean rotation reduced tile nitrate by a total of 23%. Now, how did I get that? I used the flow-weighted means from that table I showed you, and I just did what was the percent reduction. And so it was 33% reduction during the soybean phase, and yet there was sort of a carryover benefit to the corn phase of 13% lower. So I averaged the two, and it's 23%. And then spring fertilizer um, versus fall reduced tile nitrate by another 21% overall, 32% during the corn phase, and, and uh, seem to have a bit of a carryover effect as well to the soybean phase. So averaging them, those together and then adding the zero rye benefit to moving fall to spring, we're almost at the 45% reduction that we're aiming for. In fact, that's my take home message. A management consideration. So. With the serendipity of, of only having cereal rye every other year, thanks to our failure with oat and radish, um, having it only in front of soybean avoids the potential yield drag from reduced plant availability with cereal rye ahead of corn. 
And we know it's more difficult to use a grass a cover crop in front of corn. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying, well, we could avoid it and, uh, and just worry about a good, healthy cover crop in front of soybean. So in addition, though, zero rye only ahead of soybean avoids the potential increase in nitrous oxide loss due to the interaction or this potential interaction that I've read in some papers where you, with the, the, uh, the interaction of the degrading uh, cover crop residue with the added fertilizer. And apparently in the right circumstances, you can have loss of nitrous oxide that's greater than you would have without the cover crop. So that's a negative. Well, we can avoid that as well by only having the cereal rye every other year in front of soybean. Now, we have continued two of, actually four of the treatments all the way through 2023. And so we have this 50-50 split and the 50-50 split with the cover crop for eight years now. And so regression analysis of those eight years, when I look at, uh, at the flow-weighted means, um, I, it, the, the equation says to me that if we produce a 1.5 ton biomass of cereal rye ahead of soybean, we, we will have a 45% reduction. But now that's only one out of two years. So that would be uh, split in half in a corn-soybean rotation. But uh, it's nice to have a goal. We know what we can, we can have. And, and, and I have found at, at Eric Miller's a different site when we had 2.75 tons of above-ground biomass uh, in front of soybean that we, we were worried about uh, our yield. I think we lost a little yield. So I'd say the, the Goldilocks zone of, of high cover crop production would be 1.5 to 2.5. So how much cereal rye biomass do we need? And this is uh, from this NREC study and others uh, where we see that we just don't have much of a, an effect on tile nitrate until we reach uh, an above ground biomass of a half a ton. So to us, that's, that's the limit. You, you gotta have at least a half a ton or you're not gonna have a noticeable difference in tile nitrate loss. And then also, uh, if, if you're more bold and uh, you want to try planting green, that's a, a very good way to, uh, to, you know, to have enough time to get that cover crop up to one and a half tons or more. So maybe I talked faster than I thought, but I'm, I'm already to uh, thanking my funding sources. Maybe I'll actually get some questions for once because I almost never leave enough time. So, you didn't. I didn't? God, time didn't. flies when you're having fun. Sorry, you didn't, you didn't leave time for I questions. I didn't. Unless I didn't. there's one, we can maybe do one burning <laughs> question. Okay, good. <laughs>